Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Brian Sebade and I work for the University of Wyoming Extension. Today we'll be talking about container gardening. Container gardening is something that's always used throughout Wyoming every year. It's something that is important for us. We can put it into many different places and it's something that we should never rule out for recommending for other folks to use. So what we're going to go through today is the different types of containers that we have out there and then some of the vegetables that are probably more well adapted uh, for Wyoming's climate and some of the containers that are available to us as uh, just residential um, folks with maybe not a lot of room um, on our property or where we maybe rent. <clears throat> all right, so growing vegetables in Wyoming is tough. Um, as we all know, um, it's really cold sometimes during the growing season. Uh, the growing season we have is generally very short. Um, there's not a long window when we have frost-free periods. If we actually try to grow something in our, our yard or the soil around our house or our apartment we, we rent or live, um, generally the soils are shallow, they're fairly high in minerals, and usually they're pretty low in fertility and a very low organic matter. Uh, we have fairly low humidity, so plants tend to dry out really fast. Uh, we don't have lots of precipitation, and sometimes the water we have is not very, very good. Um, we also have lots of wind. We also have lots of predators. Those predators might be in the form of deer, small rodents. Uh, lots of times with our gardens, uh, we end up having plants that are green, and those plants are the only plants that are green in the landscape. And so we have lots of animals that try to find those, those green plants for nutrition. <clears throat> All right, some considerations for growing. Um, if you're looking at a container garden, um, you know, the first of all, will I be able to take care of what I plant? Um, think about how many containers you're maybe thinking about planting. Uh, do you have access to water? Will you be able to water consistently? Um, how much money are you willing to spend on that? What's the climate look like for those? Uh, containers that you have growing. Um, those are all things to really consider before you get too large um, with a container garden. Uh, will I eat the types of vegetables I plant? Uh, this happens every year. Um, somebody comes to my office and says, you know, I planted such and such vegetable and now I have way too much of it because we figured out we don't really like to eat it. So uh, thinking through that ahead of time is really important. Um, some other things might be, are you familiar with the types of plants that are available uh, for growing in your area. Um, maybe you've grown up in an area where you're really well um, versed in growing tomatoes, for example, but maybe not some of the other types of vegetables uh, that do really well in um, Laramie or Wyoming's environment. Um, will it actually grow for where you're at? You know, what's the amount of time it takes for that plant to germinate? Um, actually put on vegetative growth and then produce something that's edible for a crop. Um, some of our plants take a really long time depending on what we're looking to grow um, and there simply just may not be enough time for those plants to complete their life cycle in the summer. Um, and then the last part of that is, uh, is there too much to be consumed? Um, you know, are you going to actually eat everything that you're planting? Um, those are things to really consider before you start growing so you don't get um, down the road in August and have too many of something, not enough, um, or you just have a bunch of vegetables you don't like. Uh, so this is kind of long-winded. Um, I understand that uh, this might take a bit to go through and probably not the best PowerPoint slide here, but uh, the next two slides I kind of wanted to outline um, some of the important considerations uh, for when we are actually selecting a container. Um, so I won't go through this uh, word by word, but basically I want you to be able to just kind of look through here, uh, check out um, some of the considerations that you might think about when you're selecting a container. Um, you know, we want to think about, you know, is that a food grade container? What's been in that container? Lots of times we try to recycle different types of containers for container gardening. Um, we really want to make sure that we think about what's been in there before ahead of time. Um, you know, lots of times we'll have folks that come in and, you know, ask so they can use a, a food grade five gallon bucket for container gardening. Absolutely. Uh, but one of the things we want to make sure is that it's well drained, uh, because if it's not well drained, then we end up um, with some major issues as far as water not actually moving through that container. And then we end up with a bunch of waterlogged soil um, that just isn't great for plant roots. 
Um, we also get lots of questions about, you know, what can I put in the bottom of that container? Cause I don't want to buy enough or enough soil to fill the entire container. Um, we really want to think about um, filling that soil or that container all the way with soil uh, because those plant roots will go to the very bottom. So um, if you're trying to grow stuff and you have some really big containers, uh, maybe you need to think about that before you um, decide that's what you're going to use, but they do need to be filled all the way. Um, the other part of that is match the size of the container to the plant. Again, if you have something that's too small, um, there's not going to be enough space. You might have plants that are falling over because there's not enough uh, weight or enough stable stuff that's there as far as a container and soil for stability and those plants may end up you know, either blowing over or just simply falling over because they get too large. Okay, we also wanna think about uh, aesthetics. Um, you know, some folks may find a container, um, but then they get really sick of either the style or maybe they did recycle something and want something that's a little more attractive. Um, so those are, those are some things to also consider. Um, you know, lots of times, um, you know, we can use wood, we can use metal, we can use uh, plastic materials. There's a lot of different things that are out there. Um, but we just want to make sure that, again, we're finding something that's food grade um, and find something that's going to hold up to where the, the container is um, going to be placed. So, um, you know, some of the clay pots are really neat looking, but sometimes if they come into contact with something that hits them, they can break fairly easy. So if it's going to be in a high use area, maybe you want to think about something else that's not going to uh, potentially be cracked and, and destroyed if it gets hit. Um, the other part of that is thinking about, uh, you know, the material itself, you know, um, a lot of the clay, um, some of the wood, they tend to dry out a lot faster than say some of the plastic type containers. So if you're not going to be able to water uh, those plants, you know, daily or every couple of days, uh, maybe we need to think about a plastic type material. Um, and there again, too, some of those plastic materials may not be UV resistant, and so they end up um, actually breaking down fairly fast. So uh, there's a lot of considerations when it comes to containers, um, but simply just trying to find the, you know, what works the best for you uh, is your best bet. Uh, here's some general recommendations on uh, container size. Um, you know, for the most part, a lot of the smaller ones are going to do well for a lot of the the herbs, uh, lettuce, spinach, those types of things. Uh, medium size, two to three gallon, uh, that's where we start seeing um, some of our larger plants that we might have. So beans, radishes, peas, um, some of these that tend to, to grow up a little bit. Uh, larger containers, um, you know, four to seven gallons, maybe even a little bit larger. Um, that might be peppers, beans, um, you know, some of our larger tomatoes. Um, squash, cucumbers, all those sorts of things where we need a little bit more space. Okay, water is really important. As we've already discussed, uh, Wyoming is really dry. We have low humidity. Lots of times there's wind that is um, in the areas where these containers are planted, so they're drying out quickly. Um, so we need to be able to water them consistently. If you're not able to do that by hand, you might need to think about a drip irrigation system. Um, Generally, we want to try and water in the morning. Um, that way there's less disease issues. Um, and then that water is available during the heat of the day to those plants. Um, depending on the plant we're looking at, it might be 75 to 90% water. So they require a lot. Um, and also, as we've discussed earlier, roots need oxygen. So making sure that things are not completely saturated all the time is really important. Um, that's supposed to be pick a pot um, with a C there, and I'm not sure why it got cut off, um, but just pick a right pot that's well suited for your situation. So, um, you know, usually one growing season, you can try a couple different types and then select what you want from there. Um, ones that are going to hold the amount of water you want, aesthetics, all those sorts of things we talked about earlier. Okay, uh, so we're gonna move on a little bit now to different, different types of vegetables, uh, things that are out there. Um, so here's a, here's a real general um, definition of what a vegetable is. So here we have a pepper plant. Um, and, you know, sometimes we might be eating the leaves, the stems, it really just depends. Um, but we have a lot of different types of vegetables that are out there. Uh, the point of this definition is uh, know what part of that plant you're going to be eating. Uh, so that way you can 
can ensure it's it's well taken care of. Okay, uh, we we generally have annuals, right? So they complete their life cycle in one year. Um, they tend to have shallow root systems, depending on what we're looking at. Um, for most of what we're dealing with, this is almost all the vegetables. Here we have some lettuce, again, not real deep root system. Um, so it may try to um, drain, you know, dry out quite quickly. Um, and we also know with something like this, you know, when we get some hot temperatures, they tend to bolt or put up a seed head. Um, so that's important to remember that, you know, they're completing their life cycle sometimes fairly quickly, depending on what type of annual it is. Okay, biennials, uh, they complete their life cycle in two years. Uh, generally, the first year is a rosette, and then the second year they bolt or put up a seed head. So carrots and beets are good examples. So that rosette is where they put up vegetative material that first year, um, build up a good root system, which we like to eat. And then that second year um, is when the seed production actually happens. So people always ask, well, can I leave them in there for two years? And the answer is yes. Um, I have done that and generally I find they are not very tasty that second year. So usually they're really woody, um, you know, they're just not that great. So um, try to harvest those in the first year and treat them essentially like annuals. But if you're trying to save seed, you would need to use, uh, save them in there for two years. Okay, perennials, um, you know, that's things like asparagus and rhubarb. Generally, these are not well suited for our containers. Um, you know, they usually do better when they're directly planted into the, into the ground, um, but those are there. All right, site selection. Uh, so here we have some potatoes that are uh, planted up against a house. Um, you know, we've got a black container that probably absorbs a lot of heat. Uh, hopefully there's some good drainage that's down there. Um, so that way we, when we water, um, lots of water goes through that, that container. Um, we wanna make sure that it has close access to water. Um, the further we have to haul water, generally the less often we we think about watering plants um, and the more effort it takes and they just don't get the care that they needed. Um, find a spot that's going to be, you know, plenty of sunlight, um, not too shaded. Some of these sunny spots can sometimes get a little too hot and a little too sunny. So think about that as well. Uh, think about how much room is there? Is there any vertical obstructions that are going to stop this plant from growing up higher? Um, again, is it in a high use area or are there you know, human traffic, pet traffic, um, what's going on? Is it going to be damaged that way? Uh, is there suitable soil? Um, do you have some good soil that's in there? Stuff that's, you know, you found in some waste area and an old lot, you know, what exactly are you using? Um, and then finally, you know, what plant do we have? Is it going to match Laramie's climate? You know, even though it's in a, in a container, sometimes we can move containers inside, outside, you know, we can keep them in a garage for part of the time. Um, we can start them maybe in a low tunnel or a high tunnel in their container and then move them out. Um, but still thinking about, you know, once that plant matures, is it going to be well suited for the climate that you live in? Um, so here's a good chart that kind of outlines what we can expect for temperatures. So a lot of our warm season crops, um, you know, eggplants, tomatoes, corn, those types of things, uh, they like it really hot. Um, even if we think about some of our squashes, um, winter and summer. Um, so they like it when it's above 90 degrees. Um, so as you can see from this chart, we can generally see how many days we're above 90 degrees. So if we're in those um, cooler colors, um, generally those are not the best spots for warm season crops, uh, but they would be better for some of our cool season crops. So thinking about um, you know, spinach, lettuce, those types of things, that's where they'll do well. Um, this is really important for the average number of frost-free days. We talked about earlier about containers, how moving them in and out, covering them um, out of different structures. Uh, we can use that to help extend the season, avoid frost periods or bad weather, such as hail or things like that. Um, that's important, but we also need to just think about how much of that time will they actually be able to be outside. So um, here, you know, we can kind of use this chart to figure out where we live. And then from that chart, um, we can figure out, you know, how many frost free days can we expect that those plants will be outside. We don't need to worry about covering them or moving them. Um, with some of our larger containers, it can get really tough to move them inside and to actually get all of the plant material covered 
uh, without harming the plant when we do have frost periods. So uh, that's really important to think about. Okay, um, again, this is kind of going back, uh, number of days below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, again, we have a lot of those days depending on where we live. Um, so, you know, from all these charts, obviously if we're living in Sublette County, it's, it's pretty tough. So um, some important things to really consider for where you're at. Okay, timing. Uh, there's some spring and fall freeze tables, uh, courtesy of the um, Wyoming Ag Statistics Bulletin from 2013. Um, basically, you can go on there, find the town that you live in um, or close to it, and then you can figure out when you might ex be expecting a freeze. So, um, so this is, again, this says table shows a probability of the temperature dropping below 32 degrees or 28 degrees later in the spring than indicated. Um, so depending on where we're at, um, you know, if you're in Afton, basically you need to wait till the middle of July to hopefully avoid a frost. Um, so this can be a little bit challenging. Um, right down here at the bottom, we have Laramie. Um, so as we can see, you know, by May 20th, there's still a 90% chance that, it, you know, we're going to see a freeze. So uh, it's really important to think about this um, as you're thinking about the timing of when to plant and when you should actually get those containers out or when we should be moving them into a garage and starting them indoors and those sorts of things. And again, this is for the fall. Um, so as you can see, it's pretty tough, um, you know, for Laramie where we're at with the amount of, of time we have. Um, seeds, there's a wide variety of places we can get seeds. Um, my best recommendation is find a seed company that you like um, and stick with them. Um, there are differences sometimes. Um, sometimes things that are really cheap or you don't really know where the seed came from, you can end up with really weird, um, you know, vegetables that aren't really true to their variety. Um, so try and find a good source that works well for you um, and is going to uh, get you what you want. Um, when it comes to planting, um, you know, for our, um, containers, you can do a direct planting um, where we actually, you know, directly plant it into that container. Um, we can also we can also do transplanting where we start seeds in a very small container and then move them to a larger container that they'll be in for the rest of the summer. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we can start the seeds inside. Um, a lot of these recommendations are going to be at barnyardsandbackyards.com. Um, I'll give you that website at the very end. Um, but basically, uh, we can start them inside, start getting them larger than what they would, um, would be in the outside environment, and then we can slowly start moving them outside. Um, lots of times we'll harden the plants, so put them out. Um, for a couple hours during the day, slowly build that up. Um, but in the meantime, bringing them back inside uh, during cooler temperatures and slowly harden them or get them used to that outside environment. Uh, if we take a transplant that's been in a warm, uh, wind-free environment for two or three weeks and then stick it out into a container out into uh, a windy part of the yard, um, sometimes that shock can really kill those plants right away. Okay, planting seeds, um, make sure not to plant too deep. Um, usually it's about one to one and a half times the length of the seed. Um, so for example, if you have carrots, for example, they don't need to go very deep. Um, firm seed beds are great. Um, so if you need to really pat it down, that's, that's perfectly fine. Usually they can push through that as long as they're not, again, planted too deep. Um, we can also do some companion planting. Uh, we'll show an example of that later. Um, but you know, there's lots of things that we can do for these seeds, but making sure that they're well watered consistently, um, you know, that soil is really moist, um, is really important. Okay. Crop rotation. Um, you know, the same is, uh, true with containers. We don't want to plant, um, the same plants in that or same type of plants in the container each year. So trying to rotate that up is really important to, break up any disease um, issues that you might have going on. Um, so if you can kind of remember what might be there is really important. Uh, it also helps with a lot of the nutrition issues. So um, each plant has certain nutritional um, needs that they have. And so if we keep planting in that same container each year, we're probably going to deplete that soil pretty quickly. Um, 
here's some general rule of thumbs. Um, you don't have to stick by this completely, but you know, if we have something like a squash that tends to be a little bit heavier feeder, um, we would have a light feeder after that, essentially meaning uh, the squash requires lots of nutrients, um, whereas something like maybe a lettuce doesn't require quite as many nutrients, so we could follow that in a crop rotation. Okay, so here are some of the, uh, the crops specifically that David has asked me to talk about. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is turnips. Um, so they're in the uh, mustard family. Um, lots of times you'll hear, hear them referred to as cold crops. Um, we think of it as cold, um, but it, obviously it's thinking about the, um, the mustard family. Um, generally these plants like things where it's kind of cooler. So um, these are great for uh, Laramie and various parts of Wyoming uh, because they're going to like some of our cooler summers. Um, and a lot of those spring temperatures that we tend to have. Um, so turnips are great. They're a cool season crop. Uh, you can eat both the uh, leaves and the roots, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you can harvest them about every two to three weeks, depending on how fast they're growing. Um, and you, usually we're looking to harvest these when they're two to four inches in diameter. So uh, this is a great crop that we can grow here in Wyoming in containers specifically. You wouldn't need a large container. Um, and you can continue to plant them um, in staggered planting. So once you have some that have established, you can then go through and start planting some more. Um, sometimes when you're pulling up um, the turnips, you know, you might disturb some of the seeds that you put in, um, but it's something that's gonna work great for us. Okay, tomatoes. Um, we can have determinate and indeterminate varieties. Um, determinate varieties will stop usually about three to four feet in height. Um, indeterminate generally tend to grow, can continue to grow. Um, lots of times they'll, they'll tap out though about eight to 10 feet tall. Um, determinate tend to be shorter in their lifespan. Um, indeterminate live longer, but um, they will not come back if they're killed. So um, we shouldn't think of these as a perennial, but just as a long lived annual. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to transplant these, um, which could be important. Um, cages or support is generally needed. Um, we also need to think about pruning. Um, Iowa State University has some great videos about pruning tomatoes. Um, I'd encourage you to go check those out um, if you have some questions about how to actually um, um, prune tomatoes. All right, so lots of times we will trench tomatoes um, there's so many different varieties that are out there. Um, it's, it's crazy, but, um, generally what we're looking at for trenching tomatoes is they're really cool because we can actually clip off a few of the leaves, um, and then actually plant them in kind of a shallow trench. And this actually helps build up the roots. So we can actually use part of that, that stem that we started with, it will actually grow roots. Um, and will actually help create a stronger, uh, tomato tomato plant and a stronger base for when we actually put these in a container. Um, because again, we're probably going to need to stake these, um, use some sort of cage when they're in a container. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a really good container that won't blow over because these things are going to get fairly tall. Um, so a lot of times we tend to stick with the determinate varieties uh, when we go with uh, containers. Um, so there's a lot of different varieties that are out there. Um, I've just tried to throw a bunch that I commonly see, um, but a lot of our cherry type tomatoes are going to do great. Um, but for the most part, they're, they're generally determinate varieties, um, not always, but um, they complete their life cycle a lot faster than the indeterminate. Um, again, they're not those great slicing tomatoes that some folks like, but uh, for here in Laramie, they tend to be the best. Um, here's just some different pictures I found from the internet. Um, again, we can, we can get a wide variety of shapes, colors, sizes, um, depending on what we're, what we're looking for. So, all right, carrots. Um, carrots are a biennial crop, believe it or not, as we talked about earlier. Um, so they, uh, generally like cooler temperatures. Um, it's really easy to plant these things too thick. Um, they come in a wide variety of colors from uh, black to purple to orange, yellow, white, red. Um, there's a lot that are out there. Um, 
it just all depends on what you what you like for taste. I tend to like the purple, orange, and yellow varieties. Um, some of the white varieties like Lunar are also great, but uh, depending on what you're what you like and how you use them, um, you can switch that up. Um, again, you want to find a container that's going to allow these carrots to grow deep enough where they won't uh, hit the bottom of a container or grow too tightly together. Um, it's important to try and harvest these when they don't get too large and too thick because otherwise they can get pretty woody. Um, if you're going to use them in some type of cooking where you help break them down, that's, that's okay. But if you want to eat them fresh, usually an inch to inch and a half in diameter is the best. Um, you can also plant these with radishes. Um, they kind of help break up the amount that's actually planted. Um, and then when you actually pull the radishes out, that actually helps um, thin out some of the carrots and the actual uh, you know, size of that radish helps display some of those seeds so they aren't too close together. Um, there's a lot of different shapes and sizes as we talked about um, with the tomatoes. The same is true with carrots. Um, so depending on what you have, um, you, can, you can try and find something that's going to look the best for what your use is. Um, sometimes we can end up with things like this where there's two together, where it's obviously been planted too close together. Um, if we have a really heavy clay soil or lots of rocks, we can end up with really weird things as well. Um, these carrots are probably a, a little too large, like this one. This one might be about the right size for eating. Uh, but again, we want to make sure that they're not too close together, which can be really challenging to thin sometimes. Um, carrots also take a long time to germinate. So um, if you're planting them, just know it's usually going to take about two to three weeks for them to germinate. They're like a really humid environment. Um, so there's all sorts of tricks from throwing a piece of plywood over them to help keep the soil wet. Um, you know, little plastic covers, whatever it might be, um, just know that they need to stay consistently wet for about two to three weeks for them to germinate properly. Uh, here's some common varieties that are out there. Um, you know, again, I kind of like uh, dragon and purple haze. Lunar white's good. Um, yellows I really like. Um, so the Amarillo or the Yellowstone I like a lot. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more firm. Uh, the reds I find are a little more soft um, and not that crunch that I generally like. Um, I've always just done the Nantine varieties, uh, but there's a lot of other varieties out there for the orange as well. Okay, lettuce. It's a cool season plant. It does really well here in Laramie. Um, you know, in the past, Laramie has produced a lot of lettuce, uh, you know, many, many years ago. There's lots of different colors, varieties available, um, you know, tastes that. Uh, you know, is unique to each variety. So you can really experiment with a lot of these. Um, if you have a leaf variety, you're probably looking at some pruning during the growing season. Um, with the head type varieties, you're actually looking to um, harvest the entire head of that, that lettuce. So um, they don't like hot temperatures. So as we talked about earlier, that term bolt, so they'll tend to bolt. Um, when the temperatures get too hot and then they actually go to seed and they just aren't you know, the, the leaves are just not as tender as they used to be and not as good. So um, again, one of those we can plant early on, um, small seeds, so don't plant them too deep, uh, but something that does really well here in Laramie. Um, so these are just some different varieties that are out there. Obviously this is a head type lettuce, um, but you know, with a lot of these, we can end up just, um, you know, harvesting a lot of the leaves early on um, and kind of just harvest them as they're growing, which is great. Here's some common varieties. Um, <clears throat> so we have crisp head, um, we have uh, romaine, uh, there's different types of leaf, there's butter head, um, then there's also stock. So um, this one's not usually quite as common, uh, but for most of these, these are fairly common that we find. Um, you know, for a lot of us, we might actually end up just buying a mix, throwing that out there and then actually clipping those off and harvesting the leaves as they tend to grow in a container. All right, herbs. So here's a rosemary plant in a clay pot. Um, you know, a lot of these do well in, in uh, containers, so that's nice. We can move them outside during the summer and bring them back in during the winter. So it all really depends on what our setup is, but they're, they're great uh, for those as well. Okay, so basil, um, it's an annual plant. Um, lots of times you can pinch off the flowers to hopefully increase the lifespan. Um, you can also um, turn it into more of a bushier plant so it doesn't get quite as tall. Um, 
as we all know, you can use it fry or fried. You can use it dried or fresh. Um, you could also fry it if you need to, but usually dried or fresh. Um, and you know, you can keep them longer than um, just one year if you need to. But uh, you know, sometimes after a while, you may actually just need to replant, um, depending on how that plant's doing. Uh, so these are great. They don't take a large container. You can usually put them in a sunny window during the winter um, when they're going to be just fine and then move them outside later on if you'd like. Um, so there's different types of basil. Um, <clears throat> these are those different types. Um, so depending on what you're looking for, um, you might consider one of these. All right, chives. Um, think of chives as miniature onions. Um, <clears throat> so you might hear of chives, green onions, um, basically the same plant. Sometimes you also hear of them as bunching onions. Uh, but essentially what we're looking for with these is we're harvesting the top material instead of the roots. Um, the roots are not very large at all. Um, we wanna keep them moist for the most part. Usually a sandy soil is, is just fine. Um, they can be a perennial up to 18 inches tall. Um, <clears throat> they can be planted for aesthetics as well. We see lots of chives that are used for their, um, for their flowers. So um, there are chives and onions that are native to Wyoming, but the ones that we actually find commercially are, are not uh, generally native to Wyoming. Um, so here's some different varieties that are out there. Um, again, you know, depending on what you're looking for, maybe you want one uh, with some dark green leaves or something else like that. Um, <clears throat> but there's lots of different ones that are out there. Okay, dill. Um, again, it's in the carrot family and it's also well adapted to Wyoming. Um, plants are usually two to four feet tall. <clears throat> can reseed itself very readily if allowed to go to seed. Um, can be used fresh or dried. Um, we see it, you know, used for pickling. We see it used as a fresh herb. There's a lot of different things that it can be used for. Um, so it's one of those, if you want something that's easy to grow, um, I would recommend dill. <clears throat> Here's some of the varieties for dill. Um, you know, there's quite a few that are out there, um, but just find one, um, you know, you know, that's going to work for you, um, and you should be set. Okay, the last one uh, David has asked me to talk about are microgreens. Um, essentially, microgreens are just mixtures of edible plants. Um, so it might be flowers, it might be herbs, it might be vegetables. We can have a wide variety of things that are used for microgreens, but generally they're planted in small plastic containers, um, usually grown indoors. Um, once they've been planted, they might be in a mix, they might be um, individual plants, but we need to harvest them quickly and then used quickly. Um, they're not going to withstand lots of transportation and hot temperatures or things like that. Um, so they need to be really well watered consistently. Um, you know, some of the, the common uh, plants that we see, you know, can be kale, parsley, carrots, um, basil, arugula. Um, there's a lot that are out there. Um, so just keep that in mind that uh, there's a lot of options for you. All right, finally, um, just wanted to let you know that um, on barnyardsandbackyards.com, uh, we have a lot of resources under the gardening section related to specific plants, container gardening, soils, uh, Wyoming's climate, all those sorts of things. So if you ever have questions, check that out. All the resources are online. We also have various resources at the University of Wyoming Extension website. Um, so those, we have one specific uh, bulletin related to container gardening and others related to growing specific vegetables. So. Um, if you have any of those questions, um, feel free to check that out. Um, I appreciate you listening today. And if you have any other questions, you can always feel free to reach out to the University of Wyoming Extension, and we will be able to point you in the right direction of, of where you might need to go for, for more information. Thank you.